Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as, as John mentioned, uh, my name is Imani Lucas. Uh, I'm also joined with my co-presenters, uh, Stephanie Ramos and Richard Gallo. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, addressing the behavioral health workforce shortage and how we can do that with peer support. Uh, so, you know, we'll, uh, the agenda is, is pretty tight, so we're going to try to get through most of our material today. But today we're going to talk about uh, the CAP, California Association of Peer Professionals. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the behavioral health workforce shortage, uh, which is, is very severe, particularly in California. Um, and, and, you know, it's peer support that may be able to help fill several gaps when it comes to communication between institutions uh, and the community. We're gonna talk a little bit about that value of what peer support brings, uh, the value of lived experience in, in service delivery and systems change. We're gonna talk a little bit about supporting individuals, families and communities and accessing these resources and supports, how are we coming together um, to, to make sure that our members make sure they, they get the top uh, type of service and pure peer support services. So we want to talk about that in, in terms of supervision as well, right? How many peers with lived experience are actually working in super uh, supervisory positions um, to, to work with peer professionals in the community? And then lastly, we're going to wrap it up and, and talk about some of those recommendations and call to action. So we're going to ask you to hold your questions for the chat, and we can read them off. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a, a question and answer period. Okay, so um, I want to just kind of give some basic background uh, about myself and my co-presenter. So I'm going to explain a little bit of, about my lived experience and then pass it over to, uh, to Stephanie, who will pass it over to Richard. In the meantime, we want to ask you guys to add your name, your role, um, uh, whether it's a peer specialist, a supervisor, director, et cetera, and then your California County of Residence. So after we're done with our quick introductions, I'd love to be able to uh, shout out people from the chat uh, and acknowledge that you guys are here. So uh, get ready for a good hour, hour, 15 minutes of, of just education you're all professionals out there. So, you know, you realize the value you bring uh, to the table and to the work. And we want to make sure that we organize CAP so that peer professionals have a voice in that and, and are able to, uh, to accumulate the resources they need to serve their members, but then also to, to build our professional experience uh, as we go along and to ultimately legitimize peer work as a legitimate healthcare profession that, that is a supplement to uh, the licensed professionals who are working in the field. So, so um, again, you know, my role um, is a peer specialist and supervisor. We started United and Guided um, as uh, an answer to working on violence prevention, working directly uh, with the black and brown community in Sacramento. Um, once we heard about SB 803, we decided we wanted to go through Cal Voices and become peer professionals for the purpose of working with uh, our, our community that has mental health issues, ultimately ending violence and ultimately uh, just reducing crime and violence in our community uh, by way of, of working with more of our individuals and destigmatizing mental health. Okay. And we're out here in Sacramento County. So I want to popcorn to Stephanie and then we'll Thanks. move on. Thank you, Imani. I'll try to keep it brief because I know we have a lot to get through. Uh, but as John shared, uh, my name is Stephanie Ramos. I am a staff to CAP. Um, so my role is to really support our steering committee and our members um, and the goals of the association. Um, I actually started uh, 17 and a half years ago as a youth advocate uh, working in a county clinic um, and I've had an opportunity to work in a variety of peer roles, supervise peer programs, manage supervisors of peer programs, and now I've had the privilege of providing um, training and education to peers and employers and also um, really excited about being able to support the peer association and really advancing the peer workforce. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and pass that over to Richard. Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Gallo, he, him, his, um, in Santa Cruz County. I am a former peer counselor, initially started during my senior year in high school. I was one of the very few students, small group of students during my junior year, where we demanded that the school use part of the lottery money to set up a peer counseling program for students by students. And after that, I got a job with the Job Training Partnership Act program known as the JPTA back then as a peer counselor working with at-risk youth. And I have served as a peer counselor role providing peer support services for approximately 18 years with two separate centers for independent living in California. So welcome everyone. Yes, yes. And thank you for that. And uh, let me just give some shout outs over here for people who signed in on the chat. Mr. Jonathan Staggards. Uh, looks like uh, one new heartbeat, and he's a peer mentor. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Karen Patton, peer support specialist from Missouri. Welcome. Uh, Morgan uh, Pello, thank you. Uh, lived experience as peer counselor in Santa Cruz. Um, and thank you. It looks like that's all who uh, signed in so far. We'll check in back in the, check uh, the chat box as we move on. Awesome. So uh, thank you, Amani, for that. Um, to really get us rolling and going. Um, so in this first part, we're briefly going to introduce you to the California Association of Peer Professionals. This isn't the meat of our presentation, but kind of give you some background about um, how Imani, myself, and Richard work together um, and what our hopes are for the peer workforce. Um, so what is CAP? So CAP is a member-based organization that provides services and benefits to both certified and non-certified behavioral health professionals in California with an emphasis on education, certification, practice guidelines, professional standards, working conditions, and career development. Uh, membership is currently free, um, so we're really trying to get the word out um, around the association and the different offerings that we have. Um, so why CAP? So when SB 803 passed, um, we thought it was an opportunity to elevate the field of peer support and really organize the workforce. How do we create a united voice uh, behind that peer role? Um, we wanted to create uh, direct access to a robust, knowledgeable, and resource network of peers across California. And we want real-time support in the workplace for both peers and employers. And part of the reason why we wanted to create CAP was there was a need to strengthen and convene peers, peer-run organizations, and stakeholders to advocate on pressing issues at the local, state, and national level when it comes to the peer workforce. So really trying to represent peer employees across the state, provide them support and resources that they can use at their local level, um, and really have a united voice. So it's not just one or two of us showing up to advocate on an issue, um, but to have the whole association behind our members um, as they're trying to create change um, and how things are impacting the peer workforce. Um, our membership consists of certified and non-certified behavior health peer support specialists. Uh, we have experienced peer support workers, we have new peer support workers, and we also open our membership to individuals who are considering a career in peer support. Um, so if folks are interested, um, we invite them to join to learn more about the, the field, learn more about the role, find training opportunities, um, opportunities for mentorship, um, job opportunities, and things like that. So I am going to go ahead uh, and just go ahead uh, and cover these next two couple of slides. Um, so we just wanted to highlight some issues that we know are forthcoming um, when it comes to beha the behavior health workforce shortage. Um, there was a survey done in 2023 um, by the Health Force Center at UCSF, um, and they tried to find out, you know, how are county behavioral health agencies dealing with recruiting personnel that match their clients' race and ethnicity? Um, so this was a study they did in 2021. Um, and you'll see that in the um, Asian, Black, Native American, um, Native Hawaiian, uh, Pacific Islander, um, you'll see it's in the high 70% of where mental health and substance use providers are having difficulty in recruiting personnel that match their clients. Um, they've done a tiny bit better um, when it comes to uh, recruiting individuals that identify as Latino, Latina, and Latinx. Um, but this is 
this is from those county agencies. They are saying, hey, we are having challenges ensuring that we have a diverse workforce um, that really does match um, the demographics of the individuals that we serve within our system. And if you're interested in reading more, um, I have this source cited here, um, and I believe we'll be sharing the slides after the presentation. Um, so you can go ahead and check that out a little bit more. Um, according to a 2022 uh, study, 19% of clinical social workers, 29% of family uh, marriage and family therapists, and 10% of, I don't know what PCCs are, um, and 34% of educational psychologists are 60 years or older, right? So we're looking at an aging workforce. Um, and so recognizing that we are going to have a huge number of mental health and substance use professionals that are going to be retiring soon. Um, and because they make up such a large uh, portion of the workforce, we know that that is just going to um, increase the shortage that we already have and have anticipated. And if current trends continue, uh, California will have 41% fewer psychiatrists than needed and 11% fewer psychologists, licensed marriage and family therapists, licensed professional clinical counselors, and licensed clinical social workers than needed by 2028. So if you do the math, we're only going to be meeting 59% um, of the of the workforce need in order to provide adequate and accessible services to our communities. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass this on to Richard. All right. In this section, we're going to talk about the value of peer service and live experience and service delivery and system change. Peers are two who have similar life experiences or come from a similar background. They have common lived experience. And all of us here are individuals with lived experience. We are our own expertise as an individual with disabilities. Lived experience is a circumstances, situation, event someone has directly gone through that carries a particular meaning or significance for them. Our cumulative lived experience forms the basis of our personal identity, how we see the world, and our place in it. Peer support is a system of giving and receiving help based on the key principles that's included in shared responsibility and mutual agreement of what is helpful. Intersection identities, and these are some of the intersexual identities, racial, ethnic communities, GLBTQ plus communities, two-spirit communities, veterans, older adults, immigrants and refugees, foster youth involved with the criminal justice system, the unhoused community, and substance use recovery. Peer support staff are vital to program planning. By drawing on lived experience, peers understand what works in providing services to key populations. Peers offer flexibility in creating positive and realistic goals and timeframes. Peers create opportunities for rewarding experiences through intentional planning. Peers promote reliance on personal decision-making and taking ownership of treatment needs. Peers are acutely aware of potential problem areas in planning and the need for flexibility. Peers reinforce the benefit of working through issues and problem solving by connecting decisions with positive outcomes. Peers offer support if things don't go according to plan and naturally adopt to unexpected situations. Peers anticipate potential roadblocks in advance, but rely on client decision making in offering guidance to increase likelihood of positive outcomes. Areas where peer support must be utilized, navigation throughout the delivery of services in all areas and population, uh, such as re-entry, housing, substance abuse disorder, bridging peer support with community health work, 
building peer supervisory workforce through specific peer-led training statewide to build competency, developing career ladders focused on retaining peer service delivery and peer community building. Offering key input in crafting legislation and serving on work groups and committees, taking the pause of the peer community as any issues and problems arise, work with family members and reluctant communities, maintain networks of peer support, encourage self-care is integrated into peer supporter lifestyle. Peers can create county-specific programs to be utilized based on needs. So why it works? Basically, the goal is hope. So hope is a catalyst of recovery process where you have common lived experience, where you see myself in you, Beneficial sharing, I see you achieve personal recovery. Benefit sharing, I understand how you recovered. And it's also, am I going back? Inspiration. So this is important for all of us, including family members. Common live experience, I see myself in you. We will see self-care. I see you have achieved resiliency and self-care. And then beneficial sharing. I understand how you achieve this. And we all can achieve in what we're doing while we're maintaining our recovery. Put simply, if you joined the track team, who would you want as your coach? I would take all three of them, um, their prime examples of living with recovery and maintaining their recovery. So thank you, Richard. Uh, I can pick it up from here and talking about supporting individuals, families, and communities. You know, this brings a, a, a few challenges and, you know, out to the audience now, what do you guys feel like some of the biggest challenges for peers are now? You've worked in the field, you understand the field, you understand that this is relatively new uh, based on SB 803, which was only passed in 2020. We're also coming out of a pandemic, right? So when you think about folks um, and their trust for government and their trust for institutions and their trust uh, for some of the traditional methods of taking care of your mental health, you know, what are some challenges to peers in helping people and institutions understand that and understand that that is where that benefit lies? So I'm, I'm, while, I'm, um, while I'm looking at the chat, I'm gonna also read some of the slides just about the, the basic challenges. Okay, so evidence uh, shows that peer support, it reduces the number of emissions uh, and days spent in hospitals. Uh, it's uh, the use of acute services, uh, such as ERs, detox centers, uh, substance abuse. It also reduces depression and demoralization. The average uh, service cost per person, it also reduces, right? which means uh, better benefits for health systems, particularly those health systems that are having difficulty with their current behavioral uh, specialists and, and striking, right? But the evidence also shows that peer support increases time in the community, right? Time necessary to help people navigate and build their own safety plans and their own career plans so that peer supports can help navigate them along the way. Uh, engagement in outpatient treatment, um, active involvement in care planning and self-care, right? To be a consistent part of someone's life and helping in their recovery um, from somebody who is not um, 
positioned as as a person of authority or a person that that may be uh, not so trusted in, in today's modern society when it comes to our institutions. Um, you know, giving hope and quality of life and satisfaction with life again. You know, more reason to help people have some hope uh, that there are uh, resources and and uh, available uh, institutions or community organizations that are going to uh, be willing to help them along the way, and that they can trust will still be there. Right? Um, our rates of family reunification. Um, it increases just by uh, peer support specialists who also are reaching out to family members to help with that overall plan uh, when applicable. Uh, social functioning, helping people understand and, and being that uh, trusted person that, that, and it may be the only person that helps kind of guide them through recovery. Um, and then of course, those chances of long-term recovery um, uh, peer support just increases those chances um, because it's a longer term relationship and it's not uh, sporadic or, or in and out in most cases. So the scope of work for standards for certified Medi-Cal peer support specialists, uh, peer support specialists provides peer support uh, services as described down here below. Uh, all services must be recovery oriented, resiliency focused, culturally uh, appropriate. Um, they must promote engagement and promote socialization, promote self-sufficiency, uh, self-advocacy, promote self-natural uh, supports uh, and be trauma aware, right? Particularly around adverse childhood experiences, uh, which, you know, some people are, uh, in crisis just from those childhood experiences and they haven't had the opportunity to, to unload some of that, perhaps over distrust of somebody formal in their business where a peer support specialist may be able to uh, create a different type of uh, rapport um, and, and build trust in a different way. Um, so again, um, our peer support services, they're described as Medi-Cal peer support specialist services may include uh, promoting recovery, resilience, uh, wellness, self-sufficiency, self-advocacy, supporting identification of strengths, planning, finding, accessing uh, community resources, services, coaching, mentoring, facilitation, and or education. Uh, and then also the services may be provided individually or as a group, which, which could also uh, be key. So those uh, peer support services, are, they include educational skill building groups, uh, you know, for example, providing supportive environment which beneficiaries and their families uh, learn those coping me mechanism, problem solving skills in order to help beneficiaries achieve their desired outcomes. Uh, to, you know, great types of skill building groups, inmates to entrepreneurs, uh, is, is really a good example that works with the prison community, helps them learn business skills and, and work uh, outside of the community to make those uh, goals and, and aspirations happen. Um, again, engagement, peer support specialist led activities and coaching to encourage the support beneficiaries to uh, participate in behavioral health treatment. And then some therapeutic activity, right? Which is a structured non-clinical activity provided by peer support specialists to promote recovery, wellness, self-advocacy, uh, relationship, enhancement, develop of natural supports, self-awareness, values, uh, and maintenance in the, in, of the community living skills to support uh, the beneficiary's treatment to attain and maintain recovery uh, within their communities. Uh, again, you know, in high demand uh, in the mental health care community, um, and these are some different ways that peer support uh, specialists could, could serve uh, that particular community. So what peers do, right? So what it all comes down to is, you know, they're, support, they're supporting support groups and they're doing peer counseling, just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, as uh, closer to a, uh, a friend or family member than to a uh, a professional 
uh, licensed person who may not have that type, same type of relationship, right? The advocacy, which is very important to members in this day, uh, personal plan creation, rap, health education navigation, engagement, socialization, cultural brokerage, service referral, systems navigations, benefits, crisis intervention, and then uh, developing natural supports. Some of these settings could be uh, could be counties and community-based organizations. Uh, you know, our community-based organization is is really uh, trying to integrate into the systems right now, and it's it's not the easiest road, but it it is possible, and, and it's great that some of the laws have changed to allow peer support specialists to play a greater role, right? But we can also serve for private healthcare providers, multidisciplinary and wraparound teams wellness centers, clubhouses, community outreach, engagement, response teams, sheltered, supported uh, housing pro programs, um, court systems, diversion programs, uh, jails, prisons, probation, parole, you know, ERs and hospital, inpatient and outpatient clinics, schools, colleges, universities, uh, warm lines and crisis call centers, faith-based activities and organizations. There is, such a need for peer support um, because I feel like our value is, is in our connection with the community. And that is very difficult uh, for, for bureaucracies to make that connection. So I wanna emphasize our value and, and how um, we are very important to several of these settings, uh, all of them uh, actually. Um, so anyway, to promote and uh, continue. Uh, the core competency, our links to resources. So peers help others acquire resources, services, and supports they need to enhance recovery by linking them to resources or services that are both within and outside of the form but behavioral health services, right? Really um, focusing on whole person care and, and that client. Um, Peers must have knowledge of, re of resources within their communities as well as online resources. And, and us at CAP, we hope to uh, be one of those central resources uh, to, to help all of us continue to professionally uh, develop uh, peer support as, as a legitimate profession. Um, again, develop to maintain up-to-date information about community resources and services, we assist clients with, uh, to investigate, select, and use uh, needed and desired resources and services. Uh, it helps clients to find uh, and use health services and supports, accompanies clients to uh, community activities and appointments when required, and then uh, participates in community activities uh, with clients when requested, right? So as peers, our core competency uh, really lies in uh, not only us being a central resource, but having a network of resources that we can link our members to. Continued, you know, peers coach, model, teach information and behaviors that enhance recovery. Uh, peers have knowledge, skills, and experience to others in recovery understanding uh, that the recovery process often involves learning and growth. Um, and here, this core competency, you know, we seek to educate clients about health and wellness, uh, recovery and supports, participate with consumers in discovery and co-learning to enhance recovery experience. Uh, Want to coach clients about how to access treatment and services and navigate systems of care. You know, of course, differentiating between um, doing things for our clients and actually teaching, coaching, and, and uh, moving with them to actually do it themselves and learn how to do that consistently. Um, again, and giving clients those desired skills and strategies based on whatever plan we have put together, whether it's career plan, safety plan, et cetera. And then educating family members and other supportive individuals about recovery and recovery supports, right? And we also, uh, use these approaches um, that match the preferences and needs of clients, right? Because of that interaction, because of that careful one-on-one uh, -on -one planning 
um, it really leads it to the client to to uh, learn how to to process these this type of information on a more consistent basis uh, with that peer supports uh, peer specialist help and, and guidance. Continuing, peers identify potential risks and, and use some procedures uh, that reduce risk to clients and others. Peers may have to manage situations where there is intense distress uh, and work to ensure the safety and well being of others, right? So, putting out those small fires um, and identifying the potential for fires to flare up, you know, with, within relationships as you move along, right? And this core comp competency uh, helps to manage this crisis because it recognizes the signs of distress uh, and threats to safety among consumers in their environments. It also provides reassurance to clients in distress, creates safe spaces when meeting with clients, and addresses distress or a crisis by using knowledge of uh, local resources and services uh, and support preferences of individual customers. And then also assists uh, consumers in developing uh, advanced directives and other crisis prevention tools, right? So, helping reduce, de-escalate situations. Sometimes people who are used to doing that have no one that can calm them down. Those peer support specialists, um, you know, have the potential to help do some of that. Thank you, Imani. Uh, and, you know, I think to just at, thinking about the last few slides that we went through, I mean, these are, these are ways that we can be supporting that workforce shortage. Like, helping individuals create crisis plans, helping them find safe spaces, helping them to address that distress, um, supporting people and finding those additional resources that may reduce um, stress that they may be experiencing that is contributing to their mental health challenges, you know, supporting them in finding housing resources, um, helping address food security, um, a variety of different things. So even though we may not be the one that is prescribing a medication or providing traditional therapy, peers can still provide a lot of support, connection, linkages for folks, even though they might be waiting that 60 days to get an appointment um, or you know, longer, depending on where folks are. And so thinking about how can you know, peers address that gap um, while people are waiting, but also kind of fill in the spaces where maybe other professionals, it's not in their scope to always be doing linkages and connections or to be providing that peer support and sharing their story and helping people find hope. Um, and so even though someone may be, you know, waiting in the wings for that, that necessary um, medical support that they may need, there's a lot that we can be doing um, as peers to kind of bridge that gap um, and also address other challenges that folks may be experiencing that is kind of outside um, of what our other, you know, mental health professionals we work with might be able to provide. Um, so with that, you know, there's a lot of great things that peers can do, um, but how do we retain those quality peers? And we've had a lot of great people work in the system who have you know, left the peer field because they didn't feel supported um, and sometimes felt abused within their position. Um, or maybe there was no career advancement. They didn't have a livable wage. You know, there were a lot of things that got in the way of retaining quality staff. And so if we want to look at how peers can support the workforce shortage, how we can, you know, actually play an essential role in supporting people uh, through that shortage, um, we also want to consider how do we actually retain those people, right? We lose a lot of people to um, better wages because you can make more money with less stress in your life um, if you were to go into a different field um, outside of peer support. So there are quite a few peer employment challenges that we want to take into consideration. So, and, and I saw um, in the chat, uh, Richard was saying, you know, the medical model treatment teams don't always understand um, the role. Uh, Karen talked about working in the traditional uh, medical model, they find team members not valuing the peer role, um, asking us, you know, what we do, or maybe asking us invasive questions that aren't appropriate for our coworkers or employers to ask us. 
Um, so non-peer staff might not understand that peer role, right? That's an issue. Um, are they utilizing us the right way? Are they respecting the value? Um, we're, as peers, often expected to educate other people about what our role is. Well, what do you do? And, I, you know, as a peer, I'm here explaining it. Um, and, and it's really important because, you know, non-peer staff might not understand the role. We're having to educate people about our role, having to advocate for ourselves within our employment. It's essential that we are at, able to interact with one another, right? So that peers can share common workplace experiences with each other to feel like, they're not alone to maybe figure out how other people have addressed those issues. Um, it helps us strengthen our professional identity, right? How do I maintain my peerness? How do I maintain my values as a peer? It helps us to learn new job skills, right? Other peers might be doing things differently. Um, they may be learning about new trends in the field that maybe I haven't learned about yet. And we can also receive peer support within our profession. Um, I saw quite a few people in here mentioning the need for um, self-care um, in the peer role. Um, and how are we getting support in our role, especially if maybe we're the only peer on the team or there's only a couple of us within our agency. Um, so that ability to interact with other peers is gonna be really essential um, and, and getting the support that we need to really uh, remind us of, hey, you need to be doing your self-care or getting advice on how to advocate on a certain issue um, and, and really recognizing that an individual as a peer, I'm not alone in experiencing this maybe within my workplace and within this field. Um, other challenges is that peers may lack ongoing guidance and support related to our job duties and our peer identity. Um, like I mentioned, sometimes we're the only peer on the team, or we might have a non-peer supervisor who doesn't necessarily fully understand the role and value of peer support. Um, as peers, we might not always have mentors or role models within our organization, and we might not be given the opportunity to seek out or benefit from social role modeling. Um, so, you know, lacking information around career advancement, not having opportunities for skill development, um, or even advancing our education. Um, and so, you know, the, the role modeling piece can be really essential, especially for peers who are looking for advancement or to move up. Like, how do I do that? Which skills do I need to be building on? Um, and getting tips and advice and mentorship from um, peers who may be further along in their career. Um, another challenge is that peers often don't have a voice in management or leadership decisions. Um, and that can often just kind of reinforce the medical model and how we um, provide services, um, which often reflect the values of the organization. Um, and so if the voice of peers isn't getting to management or leadership, we know that that's potentially impacting the people that we serve uh, because we may be identifying um, these unique challenges that are the people that we're supporting are experiencing, but we're not able to get that information up the chain um, to folks who may be um, designing programs, who may be making changes to programs, and that peer voice is going to be very essential in that. So why does this matter? Excuse the typo on here. Um, peer staff are more likely to be affected by an unhealthy work environment. So, and generally workers with disabilities are more impacted by an unhealthy work environment. And that is because we're overexposed to risk, right? So we may experience stigma and discrimination in the workplace, right? The place you think you'd least expect it. Um, we often have limited career aspects. Um, you got a great peer support job, but there isn't a peer supervisor role. So how do you move up? What's next, right? Maybe there isn't a career ladder. Um, within our organization, or maybe there's no career ladder within our county. Um, and so we're limited in those career aspects. Um, we also often see that peers are not making livable wages. Um, I always encourage people to go check out um, a wage calculator. So if you Google in your Google search, you just put MIT wage, uh, uh, I'm sorry, MIT livable wages. Um, they actually have, you can search by county of what a livable wage is within that county, right? And so we know that peers often are not making livable wages. Um, and along with that, they may be limited to part-time positions, um, extra help positions where they may not be getting benefits. Um, and that's a unique challenge because we as a system have chosen to hire individuals with disabilities 
yet limit access to benefits, limit access to a livable wage. Another thing that we see with, uh, within an unhealthy work environment is a demand and control imbalance. And so that might be where there's a lot of demand put on me. I have a lot of responsibility, yet I have very limited control in how I actually fulfill the expectations. Um, and so that can put people at risk within their workplace. Um, and then role conflict. And we often see this when folks have uh, non-peer supervisors, or maybe they have multiple supervisors that they support, uh, that they report to. Um, it may also be when they have our non-peer staff don't understand our role. So as a peer, you may feel, hey, I know what my role is, but I'm being asked or directed to do things that really aren't within my scope, that really aren't within my role. Um, or I have two supervisors that are asking me to do two different things that conflict with one another. Um, and though that creates unneeded stress within our work environment um, and again, over exposes us to risk, um, really uh, affecting us in a way that can affect our health, can affect our mental health, um, affect our motivation and how we're interacting um, with the folks that we're serving. So if we're gonna support peers, we're gonna retain our quality peer staff, um, effective peer support programs are gonna require a few things. We need to have a recovery oriented work culture that values peers contributions. We need to have dedicated and influential leaders committed to peer services, committed to this work. We need supportive managers and supervisors, and we need collaborative working relationships amongst all staff, right? Collaborative relationships not treating me like I'm the extra help or the side dish that no one ordered. Um, employers must understand peer support, the nature of the peer role, and why it is a unique provider type. And with peer certification, we now have a clear scope in what our role is. Um, and like other licensed professions, other certified professions, we have to stay within our scope to keep our certification. So now certification is a tool that we can use to say, hey, you know, I can see what you're saying as a need for that client, but here's the scope of my work. And I have to stay within that just like you do in order for me to keep my certification. And so there is a best practice around supporting peers. It's that peer supervisors have lived experience and have worked in a peer support specialist role, right? So understanding that not only does that individual have lived experience because we know there are clinical professionals that have lived experience too. But they need to have really understand that peer support specialist role, that we're non-coercive, that services are voluntary, that we're not making people do things, we're not doing things for people, right, to really understand the role, because sometimes that's what we're asked to do. Can you just make them or convince them to do this? Well, can you just do it for them? Um, and so we really want to ensure that our peer supervisors have that lived experience, but also they understand and preferably have worked in a peer role themselves. So here are some common characteristics of the non-peer boss. This doesn't apply to everybody. These are just common characteristics. Um, a non-peer boss might not have or intentionally does not disclose their personal lived experience. Um, they're often licensed medical or behavior health professionals or clinicians. Um, and that has been the case in the past, especially when it's come to uh, billing Medicaid, where there's a requirement that there is some type of clinical supervision. Um, they may provide medical model treatments and interventions. So in this role, they're diagnosing, prescribing, providing therapy, clinical care, and treatment planning. That's very different from the peer role, right? So we want to ensure that someone really understands that what they do is not the same as what peers do. And although they provide maybe clinical supervision to their staff and how to diagnose, prescribe, treat people, that supervision is going to look very different with a peer uh, support specialist. Another common characteristic is that non-peer bosses are often unfamiliar with the recovery model and or direct peer services. So they may not understand the evidence base, the practice guidelines, the core competencies of peers, the scope within which we have to work, and the ethical standards for peer workers, right? Because those um, are often quite different than individuals who may work in clinical roles. Um, and so we need supervisors that can support us and back us up when we're saying, hey, this is outside of my role. This is outside of what peer support is supposed to be. 
And we often see that non-peer bosses view peers as clients or patients um, or clinician apprentices, right? How do I teach this person about what I do and how to do that? Um, or they see us as extra help. So not really part of the team, just kind of that extra help over there if we need something. So we wanted to share with you some quotes um, from non-peer supervisors. Um, you'll see at the bottom we have a uh, uh, we're citing where this comes from. Um, there was a national survey called the Perceptions of Supervisors of Peer Support Workers in Behavior Health. I encourage you to check that out. Um, and these are quotes directly from that survey. Um, so we have uh, non-peer supervisors saying, well, due to the history of illness, uh, requiring them to have a diagnosis and treatment in order to offer them the position. There needs to be an understanding of the disorder. And in my opinion, that a work wrap should be in place that can be reviewed in supervision, right? This is, a, this is a conflict. We are not the client, we are an employee, right? So this is really crossing the line of supervision when it comes to the peer and supervisor relationship. Another quote, because a peer staff utilizes their recovery as part of their work duties, then as a supervisor, I feel an obligation to check on how they're managing their wellness. Right, again, this is crossing the line of a peer or an employee supervisor relationship. Here's another quote. They are in a coach role versus a treatment role. The boundary for them and all staff can become fuzzy if not outlined and trained ethically. So we need to educate peer staff on professional boundaries, right? So the assumption is that because we're in peer roles, we don't have boundaries, right? And so we know that that, uh, that uh, misconceptions or assumptions around um, our lived experience and providing the, the services and supports that we do can become misconstrued. Um, and that really kind of tells me is that there's a lack of trust for individuals who have lived experience who are working in this field. Um, we'll give you a few more quotes. Um, so peers need a lot of coaching on issues such as boundaries, confidentiality, and conflict of interest, et cetera. Um, I don't know about some of you, but I've heard before where a peer may be advocating strongly on an issue and they're like, oh, well, well, you shouldn't be advocating on that because that's something you went through and that's a conflict. Well, that's part of the reason why we're in these roles, right? Is because we've been there and we can speak to what that issue, what the impact is, you know, what what the what the really down to earth issue is with some um, things that we're experiencing within the system. Um, more quotes. Um, I think the peer support training should have a manual they need to study and the supervisor should have a copy to guide the peer through it. Not a bad idea, right? Training and then also a manual for supervisors. How do you effectively support an individual who's working in a peer role? Um, I was asked to supervise our peer supporters with very little guidance about what that meant and what they're expected to do. Right, that's a common experience that we hear from managers, supervisors. I have to oversee peer staff, but I don't really know what their job is or how to supervise them. Um, another quote, my busy main job duties have made it difficult to research their role in order to feel better equipped for this role, right? And that's what we wanna hear from supervisors is that if they're struggling or having challenges in supervising peers, we want to know that because then we know, hey, look, there's a need for training, there's a need for support, maybe there's some coaching that our supervisors need in order to effectively support peers in their positions. Um, and then uh, this individual says, I wish as a supervisor, I was supervised by a trained peer. Um, so, you know, that's pretty powerful um, in what we're hearing um, from folks who are working in these roles. Um, so some themes from, from the, that national survey, we shared some quotes, but here were some themes. Um, Non-peer supervisors were more likely than peer supervisors to have a simplified view of the peer role, to rely on their clinical expertise to frame their view of peers that they supervise, to assume that peers need more intense and frequent supervision than other peers, than other staff. Uh, they lack clarity around the peer role duties, competencies, and expectations. Um, another uh, theme is that they lack practical experience that peers are expected and required to have, um, and that supervisors feel a responsibility to monitor the mental health of peer staff for triggers, signs of decompensation, stress, relapse, and self-care. Um, and these are serious issues because not only um, does it really prevent peers from 
from fully engaging and providing the services that we know that they can provide. But this also creates a lot of legal issues um, around, you know, employer employee relationships and getting too involved in um, any health conditions that appear may or may not even have. Um, so these are some things that we really want to be careful of as we're thinking um, about peer supervision and who is supervising peers and how are we training and educating those supervisors on how do you um, appropriately and effectively uh, provide supervision to individuals in peer roles. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it on to Richard. All right. California Association of Peer Professional Recommendations and Call to Action. Governor Newsom proposes modernization of our behavioral health system and building more mental health housing. Um, before I go on this slide, I want everyone to know and be aware of that there is a meeting that's going to be happening with the Mental Health Services Oversight Accountability Commission this Thursday from 9 to 3, but it will be in the afternoon, the particular topic on this topic regarding the MHSA modernization. We need to listen, we need to provide feedback, we need to educate them. The importance of keeping the intent of the Mental Health Services Act in serving our peers, in serving our unhoused community, and providing support and services with all peer programs throughout the state of California. Um, this is about prioritizing housing, this broadened target population to include those with substance use disorders. Yesterday, California had a state hearing regarding the definition of gravely disabled, where they wanted to define an expanded definition of gravely disabled to include substance use disorders. The problem with that is where they're going to go. They can't go to a psychiatric unit because that's not a detox center or a substance abuse treatment center. So it's going to be a huge issue. And then the focus is on the full service partnerships. These full service partnerships are contractors who provide services to the mental health community and helping to achieve or maintain their independence in their communities of those consumers that they work with. And it requires all counties to build Medi-Cal and improve accountability and increase transparency. On this part of it, it's really important that we need to make sure that transparency, including the community planning process known as the CPP with the Mental Health Services Act that needs to stay as it is. Do not remove it, do not reduce it, do not change it because it's really important to have consumers feedback, family members feedback to understand the gaps of programs and services in our counties throughout California. It's not a one size fit all. Each county has its own unique challenges, gaps in programs and services. So the recommendation is funding must require that peer support specialists be embedded in all MHSA funded programs. State level representation of peers establish a statewide peer certification, currently a county certification. State level role for peer support specialist representation, ambassador or workforce liaison. And also for us as an organization of the California Association of Peer Professionals, we want to support you. We want your feedback of issues and problems and concern so that we can help you address those issues of concerns and problems and how we can do to change it, how we can do to improve the peer workforce and maintaining the peer workforce because we don't want to lose you. 
we all, each and every one of us have a critical role in doing the role as a peer advocate, as a peer specialist, as a peer mentor, as a peer community mental health worker, as a peer navigator. There's all kinds of roles for all kinds of different peer programs and services. Expand peer supervisor training. Currently, training is only one hour for peer supervisors. Currently, training is self-paced with no live streaming or coaching. Training should be provided by individuals with peer support specialists experience with supervisor experience. Mentoring and coaching for peer supervisor, mentoring and coaching to develop peer supervisors and identify potential peer supervisor for those of us that can see, hey, Armani, you would be a great supervisor supporting peers in this program. Let me mentor you so that you can become a supervisor. We all can jump up the ladder within our peer programs and services of the employer we work for. Let's move up so that you can train and educate and use your lived experience so that we're all on the same page about the role as a peer support worker. And I think at this point, I pass it back to Stephanie. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. So um, I've, we didn't have a lot of time and had a lot to get through, but um, we wanted to share some resources. Um, if you're a peer or a peer provider, um, some organizations that you may want to get involved in. Um, of course, we want to say become a member of the California Association of Peer Professionals. Uh, membership is free. Um, we have our quarterly general membership meetings. Uh, we have a steering committee, an outreach committee. Um, we have a a Facebook group for our peers. We have a quarterly newsletter. Um, we have some members only pages on our website, which include a job portal um, for our members. Um, so we really want to encourage folks uh, to check that out. Um, we also want to promote Cal Voices, um, currently our uh, fiscal agent and providing funding for the association. Um, and they provide a free Medi-Cal peer support specialist certification training um, that does meet the requirements for certification. Um, they also provide uh, training for employers and peer supervisors, um, as well as technical assistance um, around those issues. Um, we also want to highlight the California Association of Mental Health Peer Run Organizations, also known as CAMPRO. Um, they do a lot of great work across the state, um, both for um, individual consumers, but also for peer run agencies. So if you're a peer run organization, we really encourage you um, to become a member of CAMPRO um, to help build that united voice of peer run organizations, um, especially with CalAIM coming through um, and counties reorganizing their systems. We want to make sure that those peer run organizations have a united voice um, so that we don't get left out in these changes. Um, we've seen a lot of counties start to um, not continue, not continuing to fund peer run organizations and starting to bring in much bigger um, treatment agencies um, and having peer run organizations be subcontractors um, to those agencies rather than uh, directly contracting with counties. Uh, Disability Rights California is a great organization to get involved with as well. Um, they do a lot of statewide advocacy um, around a lot of issues uh, pertaining to um, rights of individuals with disabilities. Um, they also have um, a group called PAR, um, which is a, a peer advocacy group uh, where folks are able to get together, um, discuss certain issues um, going on within the peer field. Um, and they also have a peer listserv um, that you can get on. Um, it's an email listserv. Um, so we encourage you to uh, check them out as well. Uh, Department of Rehab is a great resource for um, individuals who are um, interested in becoming a peer or who are in peer roles um, currently. Um, they provide a lot of um, resources and supports um, to help with uh, vocational rehab. Um, so if you are you know, looking to pursue a certain um, career, um, they can help support you in paying for that training. Um, so if you wanted to become a certified peer support specialist and needed financial help um, in getting the training that you needed, they could support with that. If you needed a laptop in order to actually do the training, they could support with that. 
Um, they also do upskill training. So let's say you've been working in the field for a while, but you want to advance in your career. Um, they can work with you in identifying, you know, what goals you may have and what types of supports and services they have available. Um, I do want to mention that our association has recently developed a relationship with DOR, um, and we're going to be having some um, lunch and learns, a series of uh, learning opportunities where folks can learn more about um, the Department of Rehab, um, going through some different scenarios of, you know, individuals entering the field, individuals who want to advance in the field, and what types of services and supports they may qualify for, um, and also wanting to work with them to connect our members um, to the agencies that are providing those services within their county. Um, and then SHARE, that's why we're all here, SHARE Self-Help and Recovery Exchange. Um, they provide a huge amount of um, self-help services um, within uh, uh, Culver City, LA County. Um, on Mondays, they also have a, a peer support um, session for individuals who are working in peer roles. So if you are looking for support in your role, uh, feel isolated, need support, we really encourage you um, to check that site out as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. And um, I think as the association, we're really trying to ensure that people know what is available. Um, I think no, agents, no agency can do it all. Um, and so how do we start to create a collection of organizations that really can um, come together and support the peer workforce? So uh, if you're in a peer role, worker volunteer in a peer role, we really want to invite you to become a member. Um, our website is www.californiapeers.org. And I'm going to actually put that in the chat right now. So if you um, are interested, please go ahead and check out our website. Um, you can learn more about what we're doing. Um, you can you know, join our general interest list if you just generally want to get information. Um, there's also a, a link to actually register as a member. Um, and so we want to invite all of you uh, to join um, our membership. So ways to get involved uh, with uh, CAP, the association, um, you can become a member. Um, there's a link here, but it's a lot easier to just go on the website. Um, you can join our mailing list. There's also a link on our website where you can click on that and join the mailing list. And then we also have um, a job submission form that employers can use. Um, I believe on our association page, there is uh, an employer tab you can click on. Um, and if you have openings and you're looking for qualified peer support specialists and you're like, how do I find them? Post them on that job portal. Um, and that anybody who uh, has become a site member um, is able to access the job portal. Um, we also have that job portal connected to our YZU Medi-Cal peer support specialist certification training. Um, so all of our graduates have access to uh, a job portal as well. Um, and so uh, you just post it in one place and you will get uh, instant advertisement um, of your uh, job openings to um, a whole lot of peers uh, across California. Um, so today we talked about the California Association of Peer Professionals, a little bit about the behavioral health workforce shortage, the value of lived experience and service delivery and systems changed. Um, we talked about the different ways that peers can be supporting individuals, families, and communities and accessing those resources and support and supports, um, especially knowing that we have a shortage. People are waiting longer for services or may not be able to access them. So how can we really utilize peers to bridge that gap? Um, we talked about the importance of peers providing peer supervision. Um, and then we also shared some recommendations and call to action. Um, so we have, I believe we have about 11 minutes. So if folks have questions, comments, um, we would love to hear from you all. I see Richard, you already got your hand up. So go for it. Yes, I just recently started my Medi-Cal peer specialist certification training last Saturday. So I have nine more Saturdays to go. And I'm looking forward to being certified. And the reason why that I chose to go ahead and do it because I'm serving on the California Association of Peer Professionals. So I felt very strongly as a person with lived experience, as a consumer, that I need to be certified because I'm going to be working with peers who are certified. I'm going to be collaborating with organizations, programs, and services throughout the state. 
And, you know, it's going to be a lot of hours put in, but it's value. I remember this is the same thing that happened back in high school. where We had to take nine days of training to become certified before you're able to serve your targeted population that you're serving as a peer program. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Richard. Um, any folks have questions, comments, thoughts, uh, we are happy to hear them. Um, and if you're done with us and need a break, I get it too. So if that's you, feel free to head out. Um, Stephanie? But, yes. Hi, this is Joy Della Luce. Thank you so much for this rich presentation. I'm wondering if, if um, you're available by email. I just texted you or DM'd you and I'm just, I'm not sure if you are. Yes, I just um, I just responded in the chat, um, and then oh. yeah, so you have my email there, and then also if other folks are interested in reaching out to us as association, um, this is our contact information. Thank um, you, Stephanie. See. Yes, I see a hand. Is it Javi? Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you. Um, this presentation has like really ignited my heart. Um, I thank you for like everything that you guys are doing. As a peer uh, support specialist since I was like 19, it's just amazing where this is going. Um, but on the real, like I'm glad you guys have our backs. Um, and it's just, it, it's an honor just to hear like the movement and everything moving forward. Um, now that, uh, uh, Medi-Cal is starting to certify everyone. Um, I recently got certified um, and I'm just hoping to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping to learn soon how to do the whole Medi-Cal thing. Um, I know that's in the works right now. So hopefully that moves forward. Um, and I'm definitely going to join the California peers. Um, and I think this is just an amazing presentation. And honestly, just thank you all to uh, Amani, Richard, and Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and thank you for being with us this morning. Any other thoughts, questions, anything you got to get off your chest? Um, hi, what was the, um, I think it was uh, Richard? that was talking about uh, a Zoom um, information on Thursday happening. He was talking about that. Does he have? Yes, the, the Mental Health Services Oversight Accountability Commission. Um, oh, okay. if, if you would put your email, uh, your email on the chat, I can email it to you. Okay. After we're done here. Okay. Hi, um, I have, I just wanted to express that I have, I am a, a peer um, supervisor in the mental health outpatient system. And we are in the process of becoming certified. Three of us so far are certified out of 10. Um, and I'm really having anxiety about what it's going to look like when we do start the Medi-Cal billing reimbursement, you know, what our billing code might look like, what, you know, um, because I've had experience in the past of what billing and the language of having to, you know, um, to use according to um, to the treatment plan of the client, but not our treatment plan, but the treatment plan of the clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anywhere where we can kind of get a look at what people that are certified and that are billing, what it looks like? Um, so maybe we can start. Um, trying to, you know, uh, learn in that area, try to prepare ourselves for, you know, um, the language, the, the, the building. Uh, hey, Stephanie, can I respond to that one? Go ahead, Richard. Uh, Mary McQueen, who um, works at Painted Brain. I know Mary. Um, yeah, she's a wonderful <laughs> lady. She was one yes, of our access ambassadors with us. Um, very compassionate lady. So uh -huh. she... 
the the language will be based on the codes of our SB 803. It's not going to be the same codes as the other Medi-Cal codes that county behavioral health use or treatment service providers use because they're more clinical. They have to right. write in such a way so that they can get reimbursed. If it's not written in an appropriate way, it's not going to get billed or you're going to end up owing if it was already paid after the review by the state or the federal government, um, because it's at all levels of government reviews. Um, we will, I am monitoring this piece. I'm just waiting for a response back. I'm doing research on it from other states, see how they're doing, whether it's working or not working, various challenges they're facing so that we as a California Association of Peer Professionals can help our state guide to make it easier for all of us so that we have the proper understanding and training how to do case notes relating to peer support billing. But it's not going to be clinical, and it's not supposed to be clinical because that's yeah. not our role. Right. And, and Jerry, I have a few tips maybe that might be helpful. Um, one is that um, if you and your fellow supervisors go through the peer certification training, one of the training components needs to be documentation skills. And so if you go through certification training, they should cover some of that within uh, the training that you attend. Um, yeah. The second thing that I would recommend that you do is reach out to your county's quality management team. Uh -huh. and ask them to do a documentation training for your teams and maybe even countywide. Um, in Sacramento County, they've been able to do that for our peer teams um, to go over the billing codes, what they're appropriate for, and even give some scenarios um, around what that language might look like that you were, you, you were to use to document. Um, okay. And then something that we have found helpful in our peer programs is that um, we create a program guide for all of our peers. So just like a simple binder with like the information about the program requirements. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a document that lists all the billing codes that peers would use and what activities would fall within those billing codes. So every time they are to document, we're like, pull out your binder because you need mm -hmm. to see like which code should you be using. And then we've also, um, some of our supervisors have created um, like a documentation template language um, okay. for each of those codes. And so when the staff go to document, if they're not sure, they can go back and be like, oh, I can use language kind of like this to help document the um, the interaction that I had or that missed phone call that I made. So just some food for thought. Okay, thank you. Do, is there is there a, um, find those different codes that you're talking about, Mark? And um, yeah, so they the so what I've at least what I've seen so far is that um, Medicaid or Medi-Cal has codes, but your county may have specific codes that they're using, okay. and so that's why I was saying reach out right. to your county's quality management team um, okay. because they're going to know which codes your county is using, and then right. I would put it on them. Say, okay. hey, can you guys you know do a webinar or some type of workshop with our staff, actually peers countywide, to make sure that we're all. Um, doing this appropriately. Okay, thank you so much for that direction. Mm -hmm. And do you guys have the the? I know the one hour training was mentioned that they only have for supervisors. Do you guys have any other that you know of um, that maybe I can refer to to get more training as a peer supervisor? Yeah. So, um, um, so right now mm -hmm. the required <clears throat> training for peers or the required training for supervisors who will be overseeing peer support specialists. Cal Mesa is providing that required training, but it's only one hour. That's what we were referring yeah. to. Yeah, I've um, completed that one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Cal Voices uh, can provide an employer training. That might be something that need, needs to be contracted though. So you can reach out to them. Uh, Campro provides some training. Um, Share may provide some training. So you might wanna reach out to some of the peer run agencies. Okay. Um, even reaching out to the training providers that are on Cal Mesa's uh, training list, um, because many of them may provide a longer uh, peer training or peer supervisor training as well. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay. Um, and then Shelly, who is in the chat, 
um, is from Washington and they um, are providing training um, on documentation. Um, Shelly, are you okay if I drop your email in the chat to everybody or do you, <laughs> would you prefer I not do that? We can do that, yeah. Was that a yes? Yes, that's a okay. yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to drop some information um, in the chat really quickly. Let's see. Uh, Shelly is the name. And then I'm just going to go ahead and paste uh, their comment. And uh, Shelly's email is in here as well. So if you are looking for more information, um, that is another resource. I have a quick question if there's still time, Stephanie. Um, this is kind of tapping onto the billing effective July 1st with the new codes. Um, what if you're in an area of specialization? I, we're a little confused on do you have to have had the specialization training before you can start billing in July 1st if you're working in an area of specialization as a peer and as a supervisor? So I don't know about specialization codes. That I don't, I don't know if they've made them or if those are available yet. Um, but, and, and right now they're also the only requirements that I have seen that, that have any requirement around specialization is for those serving family, parent, and caregivers. And that's what um, I'm referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those trainings aren't even going to be launched until July one. Right. So, um, I would say information to come. I, I haven't heard anything yet about that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I know we're coming up on our time. John's probably ready to cut us off. It's 1146. Um, so if folks have uh, any more questions, need resources, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if if I as staff don't have the answers, we have a whole steering committee of folks with different uh, expertise throughout the state um, that we can try to utilize to get folks uh, questions answered or any resources you might be looking for.